Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to another episode of It's All Relative. Thank you so much for joining us once again. In May of this year, I sat down with Mace Dirani, a very successful real estate broker with Remax Ultimate, where we talked about the record-breaking real estate market in Toronto. However, everybody knows that it hasn't been the same ever since. I'm extremely grateful to have him here with us once again today to discuss exactly what has happened since then and where we are at this present moment and what we can expect going into the new year. Mace, thank you so much for being with us once again. I look forward to this chat. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Excellent. <sighs> now, first thing, um, obviously a lot has happened since April, May yep. of this year. Mm -hmm. I want you to start us, start us off today by taking us through exactly what happened, okay. what happened during the summer that we've just been through, mm -hmm. and where we are as of today. Okay. Um, last time we met, we had discussed uh, Ontario unveiling their Fair Housing Act, uh, which more or less uh, introduced 16 different policies, uh, which was aimed at slowing down the housing market. Uh, right. Some notable um, points within the 16-point policy uh, update was uh, foreign buyer tax. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the bigger ones. Um, there were a couple other ones, but inevitably, there wasn't much um, meat behind the whole movement. Um, it, was, it was really the perception that the buyers, uh, they had from the overall announcement that caused the market to perform a bit more sluggishly. So what we had seen was uh, a bit of a drop in overall uh, sales activity, mm -hmm. uh, prices when compared to months previously, they were starting to go down as well. Uh, as a result, inventory started to go up as a lot of uh, sellers who were waiting for the perfect time decided to, uh, to sell. Um, and this kind of did create a bit of a perfect storm as we had mentioned last Correct. time. Yes. And we did see a bit of a dip in the market. Um, throw in the fact that our summer markets are traditionally a bit slower in Toronto right. uh, as a lot of people are enjoying the, the nice weather, they put the housing search on hold. Um, so you throw that into the mix, you know, the numbers did not do so well over the summer. Um, in July, uh, the days on market number, so that's a, a key indicator of whether or not we're in a buyer's market or a seller's mm -hmm. market, days on market peaked in July. Okay. And it hit uh, a number of over three, uh, three months. Three so months, yeah, right. so when you get to that level, three, three and a half, you start to dabble into the buyer's market territory. Okay. Okay. Um, come August, what we noticed was that days on market indicator, that number, it started to come down again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was uh, a, a you know it was a sign of relief for a lot of um, sellers, a lot of owners. That was uh, an indication that the market was starting to bounce back into the seller side. Right. Um, so that was good. But, you know, since the Fair Housing Act announcement, there have been a couple other changes. Um, the interest rates have gone up a couple yeah, times. Twice, yeah. So what happened most recently um, was an announcement made by OSFI, which is the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. And mm -hmm. what they um, made an announcement in regards to was a harsher stress test that would be targeted towards low ratio uh, purchasers. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, the dream was, you know, if you don't have enough of a down payment, the goal was to get to 20%. Right. Put your 20% down, you don't have to pay your CMHC insurance, you don't, you'll be uh, subject to potentially better rates. Uh, the overall process is a little bit easier. Um, when you're less than 20% down, you have to deal with harsher stress tests, which would enable you to potentially not purchase for, you know, as high of a purchase price as you're looking to purchase for. Right. But now what they've done is they've made this stress test applicable to anybody and everybody mm. who's looking to secure uh, financing. Right. So if you're looking for a mortgage from one of the, the main lenders, um, you will now, regardless of how much you're putting down, you will now be subject to a harsher stress test. And this has the market um, a little bit worried, a little bit concerned um, as to where we'll be heading into the new year. That's now, kind of I'm glad you brought it up because yeah. as I was preparing for, for today's episode, mm -hmm. uh, some of the research that I was doing, this phrase came up a lot, the stress test. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm guessing it's something that's always been there. It's just that they've toughened it up a little bit. Correct. Now, um, and I, and I want to go into a sp uh, specifically this test mm -hmm. going into January 2nd or January 1st, 2018. Yeah. Does it mean right off the bat that it's going to be harder to secure financing now? 
Yes, it, okay. it does. It does. So what, is it, what this means is, oh, let's try to use an example yeah. that will hopefully paint a clearer picture. Let's say you have uh, an average couple that makes um, a combined household income of $100,000. Correct. Net, okay? Net, not gross. Net, okay. okay. And yeah. let's say that today, under current uh, mortgage conditions, they would qualify for a purchase of about $750,000. Okay? okay. If they were to wait and put off their search into the new year and get requalified with the new harsher stress test requirements, they would lose 20% in purchasing power such that they would now qualify for a purchase price of about 610, 615,000. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So that is the concern. And it's, you know, inevitably, if they want to buy the same house, they have to show income of 20% more, which, right. which is more or less impossible. So that's where we are right now. And that's why up until the end of this year, a lot of buyers who have already been pre-approved are, are rushing to the market to ensure that they secure a property before the year is up. Well, that would be the normal thing to do, yeah. Their goal is to ensure that they have the largest amount of purchasing power. And right, if you were right. being told that you will lose 20% of your purchasing power come the new year, a lot of them are like, okay, let's just get what we can. Yeah. Let's ensure that we, are, we qualify. Um, because you know they may have to change their you know their parameters come the new year Absolutely. in order for them to qualify for something that they are they can afford now. Okay, interesting. So um, so having said that, now yeah. that we're talking about the new year, yeah. um, at this present moment, what can buyers and sellers do to prepare for 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 January second, first or second? Sure. Well, mm -hmm. one point I want to make clear in regards to the stress test. So just to kind of um, explain exactly what it means is let's say that you were to go and get qualified for a mortgage today and the rate they're giving you is 3%. Okay. Okay. And you're putting your 20% or more down. At 3%, you would be qualified for X amount. Okay. And you'd be given your mortgage. Good to go. But now what they're going to do is they're going to ensure that you can pay not only that 3%, but that you can pay 3% plus an additional 2 percentage points on top of that. So mm. they'd qualify you for 5% or the Bank of Canada lending rate, the fixed rate, whatever's higher. Right. right. So it's a little, it's, it's not exactly the best situation for buyers to be in. So many people who are qualified for, let's say, 700, 800,000, and they know they can get that property for about that much right now, they're right. probably going to want to make their move right now. So that's the first piece of advice. If you're concerned that in the new year, you're not going to qualify for, you know, the purchase price that you're looking to make today, perhaps you want to hit the market a little bit extra hard right now to secure your property before the year is up. Right, okay? absolutely. Come the new year, um, you know, it's still very early to determine what people can do, but there are a couple of different thoughts that are, are kind of going out there. Go so ahead, yeah. one loophole that people are kind of bringing up is that for people who are, are high ratio, so they're putting less than 20% down, okay, okay, they can only qualify for a 25 year amortization period. There's no mention about people who are qualified or are putting 20% down or more and how much they can use in terms of mm. their amortization period. Yeah. So in theory, they can still stretch it over to 35 years if as long as the lender is okay with it because OSFIA hasn't actually mentioned that they're going to regulate that, that part. Okay. So if that were the case, then there's a good chance that person, if they decide to stretch out the amortization period from 25 to 35 years, they would still qualify for that same same type of property at that purchase right. price. That said, they're going to take on more debt. Of course. Absolutely. Right? So that's not ideal, but it is a, a quick fix solution potentially. Got it. Another option might be, and of course, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a mortgage broker. I'm a real estate broker. It's not my area of specialty, but right. I, I'm hearing, you know, institutions that are not regulated by OSFI, for example, credit unions, okay, um, private lenders. Mm -hmm. These are people who may seek this as an opportunity. Uh, to get in and offer rates okay. that are still competitive. Right. Um, I was talking to a mortgage broker today, and what he said was one of the unintentional consequences that he's noticing is that because people are, they have to more or less determine what's more important to them. Okay, so the variable rate versus the fixed rate. Right. The variable rate right now, which is going to go up again, who knows when, but it will, is more attractive right now because when you compare that with the Bank of Canada lending rate, okay, mm -hmm. the Bank of Canada lending rate is a little bit higher, so they can qualify a little bit better, or they can qualify for more, a higher purchase price than if they were to go with the fixed rate because their fixed rate versus the Bank of Canada lending rate, the fixed rate is going to be higher, mm. right? So that okay. would inevitably allow them to purchase less. Right. So that's another solution. At least that's what some people are, are deciding to do. Um, but it, we still don't know how this is going to play out. You know, the big concern is that 
however way you want to slice it, in the new year, the average buyer is going to have a lot less to work with. So mm. if sellers want to ensure that they sell at a, you know, in a timely fashion, they're probably going to have to get more realistic on their, on their list price. Okay. So that's one of the big concerns, right? Interesting. Uh, now, speaking of the list prices, what sure. I wanted to kind of touch on now yeah. is inventory levels. Yes. Um, can you take us through, through the summer? Yeah. Um, I, I'm guessing inventory levels went down. At what point did they start going up and do you see that continuing towards the end of the year into the new year? Okay. Um, and, and we can break it down between you know, detached homes and, and condos if, if you have the numbers. Well, generally, um, inventory levels usually spike in the springtime. Okay. okay. That's when a lot of people are rushing to sell. A lot of people aren't selling so much in the winter months. Okay. So leading into the spring, inventory starts to increase. Increase, yeah. A lot of buyers are out and active at that time, which is mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. As a result of the Fair, Ho Fair uh, Housing Act that the Liberals introduced, we did see a spike of inventory in the April, May, June months. Right. So we saw a lot. Now, inventory is good if you're a buyer as a seller and you're competing with a lot of other, other sellers, it's not ideal. Right. Um, so we did see a spike in inventory. Um, we didn't see as many sales. So a lot of homes lingered, they stayed on the market. Mm -hmm. um, there were situations where people, you know, they purchased first, decided to sell after, which was the norm for so long, and that has changed now. Yeah. Um, and some people got desperate and they had to sell. So, you know, inventory levels, they tend to go down in the summertime. They were, they were pretty much the same. Um, in the fall market, we did see inventory levels start to rise again. Right. And I do expect inventory levels to go up even more as a lot of people will decide to rush to sell before the year is up right. in order for them to, you know, I guess, target the largest group of potential buyers, which will be out and about until the end of the year right now. Correct. Right. So to answer your question, inventory levels, you know, they're, it's, they're, they're where they were. They're, they're, there's not much of a, a change, okay. I would say. Um, it, you know, you're, what we're most concerned with is, is, is sales. Uh, right. Sales numbers are down. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's a concern, right? Inventory levels are, are a little bit higher, I guess. Sales down. Um, that can lead to devaluing of prices. Right? Absolutely. Now, what I wanted to... We, we, we've discussed the stress test. Yeah. We, we, we talked about what's been happening uh, since, I guess, April was probably the, the peak. Right after which things kind no, of started I would, to. No, I, I would argue that middle of March, beginning middle of, of March. March, middle okay. of March was, was more or less, uh, you know, the crescendo of, of, of where we, I guess, a lot of times if, if you sold at that time and you were mm -hmm. able to close on your transaction, then you did very well. So I okay. would say middle of March. Okay, now, I just wanted to, to, to touch on something, maybe a slightly negative aspect of yeah. what happened. Um, I did see or read about instances where. Yeah people had signed contracts mm -hmm. um, with purchase price, yep. you know, in March or in April, closing at some point in July. Mm -hmm. um, but then obviously the value of the property dropping considerably during that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to those people? Um, did they, I'm sure, I mean, that's a, a conundrum that, you know, they, did they back out of those deals or, or how did they, what options do they have if they don't want to pay the price they signed for? So you bring up a very good question. Um, you know, there have been many situations um, in the last couple of months where people, they sold at, at a peak time. Right. Uh, the property were to, was going to close in a couple of months later and the buyer decides to back out of the deal. Okay, so mm. the question is, why would he do that? Well, you got to look at it from his angle. So, I mean, if you purchase, a, let's say, a detached home in Richmond Hill for $2.6 million right. and close to the closing date, the same type of home is selling for $2.2 million. If you put up a $200,000 deposit, mm. a buyer may say, okay, what am I, how am I going to mitigate my losses the best? Do I close on this deal and do I take you know, a loss on my, on my equity or do I see what other options I have? Now, in, in essence, there really aren't any, any options. You're supposed to close on the deal. Absolutely. But if you don't, what happens? Well, what happens is you go into mitigation. You go into, uh, uh, let, sorry, litigation rather. And what happens then is the deposit gets stuck and you know the seller can, of course, sue for damages. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole, it's a whole process. Um, what does happen a lot of times is the buyer and seller come up with a deal um, oh, so they talk about sometimes it. Sometimes they come okay. up with, it, with, with some kind of solution right? Um, where the, the seller gets a large portion of the deposit, maybe the whole amount. They sign a okay. mutual release, they get out of the deal, and the seller's got to start all over again. 
Ah, perfect. Uh, it ha well, not perfect. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually horrible. It's <laughs> yeah, actually worst yeah. case scenario. Thankfully, right. it's never happened to me. But right. <laughs> it's one of those situations where it's not ideal for anyone involved, mm. and it has happened a lot more in the last few months than we than we've ever seen in, a, wow. you know, in decades. So I can only imagine. Um, it happened back in eighty nine and ninety uh, when that crash happened. So yeah. um, at the end of the day. A, a buyer is going to do what he's going to do. You can't Correct. really stop him. And yeah. the consequences that come as a result of that, you can't stop those either. Uh, a lot of times buyers will end up closing on the deal mm. because they don't want to be sued. Okay. Uh, they, they don't want to have to deal with any of those type of, of consequences. Got it. Right? Now, over the last few months, um, a lot of the headlines that we've seen uh, in the news about the real estate market have been mm. very negative. Um, yeah. And one of the words that I, I keep seeing being thrown around is uh, the Toronto market is in free fall. Mm. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, is this just, is it really, are we in a free fall or is it just a correction that was bound to, to happen at some point and eventually things will re recover from, from there? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict yeah. the future. But what I can tell you is that, you know, we did see um, years of unsustainable growth. Uh, right. You know, 30% appreciation year over year. Many people predicted that a lot of this was artificial, right? So we did see prices drop, um, especially when you want to compare to months previously, um, to a year previously. We did see prices drop. Um, right. Are we going to continue to see that? It's hard to say. Um, I, I think that this new stress test announcement, it's kind of a big deal. Um, mm. We're a little bit concerned in regards to who's going to actually be qualified to make the purchases of right. these really expensive homes next year, right? right? So that's kind of a concern. Um, the concern is, well, there's two schools of thought, okay, uh, in terms of where we're heading, okay? A lot of people think that prices are gonna drop and they're just using simple rationality, which is that most people will lose 20% of purchasing power come the new year. If Bob and Sally are approved for 750 and now they're approved for 615, they're either going to have to decide on a smaller property, mm. okay, or they're going to have to wait for a Mr. Seller to say, okay, you know what, I'm not getting the price that I was hoping for. I'm going to have to align my market value to what these people can purchase, right? right. So that's one school of thought. So a lot of people think that the prices are going to drop. Okay. Another school of thought is that you're going to have a lot of people who are looking to, to purchase uh, to make the, the, that one you know, move up, you know, sell their smaller home, make the move up. Um, but now they're going to be in a position where they can't do that anymore. Hmm. So as a result, they may decide that, okay, you know what? I have a little bit of extra cash. I may decide to buy an investment property and not do the move up. Maybe hmm. I'll spend a little bit of money renovating my place. Right. But the premise is I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay put. And if a lot of that happens, a lot of people decide to not sell, then inventory will be regulated and prices right. won't drop, at least not as fast as people are predicting. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that there's going to be a bit of both, and depending on okay. what area you're going to look in. You have a lot of empty nesters who have been sitting on this property of theirs as you know their nest egg, right. and they're waiting for the right moment. They don't have to go out and purchase another property after this. Correct. A lot of them will decide to potentially rent, so you may have excess inventory. It's, it's very possible. Have you heard anything, just in terms of the circles that you're in, Yeah. Um, have, has anyone assigned a percentage to the correction come, come the new year? Has anyone said anything in terms of um, the, the new stress test yeah. once it gets implemented? Have any percentages been thrown around? Just just ballpark, I mean, and if, what, if anything you've heard. What I've heard is, you know, quite naturally you would suspect a, a price drop of maybe 20% because okay. if people lose 20% purchasing power, Mm. Right. In order okay. for market value sense. to align with what the new purchasing power is, you're, you're looking at a, a similar drop um, unless you get, you know, unless things change, right. uh, unless, you know, there's another market that opens up that will allow people to get in and not be subject to this new stresses. As we discussed, you know, mm -hmm. credit unions, potentially private lenders, you know, there's a lot of immigrants that are, are coming to uh, right. Canada, specifically the GTA, and they're coming with cash. So these people won't be affected. Right. So and we have one of the largest number of immigration uh, in terms of, you know, inter Absolutely. internationally. Right. So there's a lot of key elements that are going to help sustain, you know, the overall market values across the board. Good. But, you know, there's a lot of people hoping for the opposite. Yes. A lot of people who are renting, waiting, timing the market. Right. In the next year, this could be a great come up for those people as well. Good. One so, thing for mm -hmm. sure yeah. is that the rental market 
is going to continue to outperform. Yeah, like it has. I like it has. Yeah. It's, the, the market rents are going up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as a lot of people look for an alternative to purchasing, to home ownership, right. uh, renting is becoming a good option. Good. So overall, I'm guessing real estate is still a solid investment long run it is Canada. You know, can i mention one thing um condo market is doing really well uh yeah. you know overall everything considered it's, yeah. it's it's performing much better than what people had expected Good. um there's a lot of reasons for why that might be the case one reason is you know a lot of times these buyers who were hoping to buy their townhouse semi-detached they're getting realistic. They're like, you know what? We're not going to be able to afford that. Let's get into a two bedroom condo while I can still afford it. Right. So we're seeing the condo market doing well. Um, the new built condo market is doing very well as well. So people are investing. That's for sure. Yep. When it comes down time to their, you know, when it comes down to their primary res residence. Um, yeah. So everyone has a, a different situation at hand. So I'd rather, I'd rather deal with them on a case by case. Absolutely. Right. Mace, thank you so much for coming on once again. My I pleasure. appreciate everything. My pleasure. I look forward to hopefully uh, updating you in the new year in absolutely. regards to uh, how this stress test announcement uh, played I, a role. Absolutely. We'll make it happen. We'll yep. make sure we have you on once again and uh, we'll, we'll reconvene then. I pl my pleasure. Um, I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. Uh, I will be putting Mace's contacts in the description uh, below. So if you have any questions that you want to ask him uh, about anything about real estate, anything in general, please uh, feel free to reach out to him. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, please, please subscribe to the channel and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you. Bye-bye.